Great. Hello everyone. We have with us Mr. Phil Smith, General Manager of Reuters, South Asia. Hello Mr. Smith. It's a pleasure to have you for the Jerome Speed column of the South Colony. I have some few questions running down here. So the first question for you is, you have been in India and you've worked living here for quite a while, right? So how is your perception about Indian journalism? Indian journalism. Um, like most countries, there's good and there's bad. Um, it's Indian journalism, I think, in the main, is very transparent. In other words, as soon as you start to read a story or pick up a publication, you know exactly where they're coming from. All right? You know, you watch the TV, you know exactly where this channel or newspaper's loyalties lie. So you know where they're coming from. And that's fine. You know, most publications will have some kind of, for want of a better word, bias. You know, politically or whatever. Um, and as long as you understand that and know that as the reader, then you're fine because you can make your own decision. It's when publications hide their political leanings that you have to be a bit more careful. But I think in the main, Indian, it's, 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 it can be a free press. It stands independent. I spend a lot of time in China where there is no free press, uh, apart from the international organisations. But in India, I would say it's fairly transparent. Well, but that is not something that we really experienced here. Mm. Because they have been trying to want to publish something, but then the editor would never let us publish that. Yeah, well, that's that's the individual publication's particular bias, and that happens in every country. Okay. You know, that happens in the UK. There's a left-wing press, and there's right-wing press, and there's centrist press. So that's not peculiar to India. It's just in some countries it's more extreme than others, and I think in the main, India is reasonably independent. It's not, it doesn't totally toe the government line. There are TV stations here that are very anti-government and criticise the government all the time, and that's very healthy. As long as you understand that as a reader, that's fine. In some countries, it's a lot, lot worse than it is in India. So basically, India is better than India? Yes, absolutely. Alright, so the next thing is, online media is gradually taking over, right? So what do you think is the take of online media in India? Online is difficult. Online is, is, is a medium where people have to get used to paying for quality news. And I think we've turned that tipping point on the internet. You know, in the early days of the internet, everything was free. There was a huge amount of rubbish on there. There was stuff you couldn't really trust. Now publications are getting to grips with actually publishing their items on the web. Um, they need to get some sort of financing from it, otherwise they die. Okay. You know, they have to monetize it. And that's, that's the trick. It's very easy to put a newspaper online and stop selling a newspaper, but then you have no income and you can't employ any journalists. And so the trick is to actually make it pay. If they can make it pay, there's nothing wrong with online news. The downside of online news, and the reason the newspaper industry in India is still actually growing in some areas, is because the internet penetration here doesn't cover the entire country. In fully developed countries, it's fine. People don't buy newspapers because they can see it all online. In a country like India or China, not everyone is online. Not everyone has even got electricity. So you have that problem. Once you get full internet penetration, then you can, online publishing can really take off. At the moment, it's confined to the elite, if you like, mm -hmm. and the people rich enough to have access to the internet. That's the problem. So how long do you think will it take for India to get adapted to things like that? Oh, I would have to be an infrastructure expert um, to work that one out. But I think for certain types of news, if you're publishing news for like the rich middle class in Bombay, mm -hmm. or you have a TV channel for the rich middle class in Bombay, you know who your audience is. You know, it's no good having an online newspaper for people living in the middle of Tamil Nadu, because they may not have access to the internet. If they do, it's very limited access. You know, the one thing you've got here is very high mobile phone penetration, 3G penetration. Yes. Now, people can get stuff on phones. Now, with the advent of good, affordable 3G, that's a different, that's not really the same as online, which is more internet, but mobile news and stuff like that, that's probably where the attention should be put because that's, your audience is much, much larger in India. All right, so what was the most challenging part of yours in Reuters uh, International News? Most challenging what part of my career or challenging job? Challenging part maybe? Challenging yes. part of my career. I think probably the beginning of it. I think sitting down to be a journalist is tough and it's, it's a series of techniques that you have to learn. Once you learn those techniques it gets much easier. But being a journalist is hard work 
And writing for editors is hard work, particularly if your editor doesn't agree with you or agree with your style. So I think when you're starting, when you're trying to find your feet in the news business, it's difficult because a lot of it comes through experience. And when you don't have that experience, it's clearly very difficult. Once you have a lot of experience, journalism becomes a lot more fun. So how long did it take you to get used to that? Um, I would say 10 years. Yes. I think it does take a long time to become a good journalist, frankly. Um, it's difficult. I mean, I've never considered myself to be a particularly good journalist. I've done very well, I think. But, quite honestly, there are better journalists than me around. And it, maybe it took me longer than, than, than some other people. But, quite honestly, I think once I've done 10 years and done some really big stories, then you start to get into your stride. It's, it's doing those huge events, the big events, the Berlin Wall coming down. Those kind of events, when you're living those kind of historical events, then you start to get a, um, a much more positive attitude towards your work. So, did you ever have a fear of death or maybe something else while you were reporting on the US past life? You tend to, um, part of the reason people get hurt when they're covering hostile events is because they think, I'm a journalist and I'm here as an observer, I'm not part of this event. Yeah. That's when people get into trouble, particularly visuals, mm -hmm. whether they're looking through a camera lens or, or sorry, looking through a still camera or looking through a camera lens, a video camera lens. They become divorced from the reality of where they are. But when you're actually doing it, even as a journalist normally, you tend to get so wrapped up in the story and reporting you forget how dangerous it is. So, yes I have, but after the event. I would come back and two or three days later you think, man that was dangerous, why did I do that? Um, but it, it comes later because you're wrapped up in the story. But that's one of the things you've got to think of when you're doing the story is, is have some eyes and ears around you so you know what's going on. But yes, definitely. So did it stop you from going to the next events or anything else that you covered? It's never stopped me, no. Um, it does stop some people. You know, I've known journalists when they get married and have children, they say, right, that's it. Okay. I've got children now, I've got responsibility, I don't, I don't want to do this, and that's fine. So we always have to be looking as a company to look for the new generation, the next generation of people coming through to do that. Some people do it their entire lives, and we have to eventually retire them off because they get a buzz out of it. But no, it, it's, it's tricky, so it's, it's, it, you tend to do that kind of reporting when you're younger. Mm -hmm. and when you get a older, you tend to say, no, 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 let the youngsters do this, I've got responsibilities. Another question really you could just ask. Uh, how has the shift from reporting on the field to behind the desk been for you? Um, I've kind of done, I keep doing events. So, like I was in Japan not too many years ago, so I, st I still kind of get involved in the big events. But um, generally, it's, it's, it's just, you, you still get involved in the big story, you see. You know, even when you're an editor or a senior editor or a desker, mm -hmm. you're still part of the story. You know, you're still editing the story. You're just not up to your neck in mud, soaking wet, tired, thirsty, hungry, and all the uncomfortable things that you are when you're in the field. But you're still part of the story. So if you get a buzz out of the news, that never really goes away. But for agencies like ours, um, those senior people tend to actually go to these places and, and report and be there anyway. So that never kind of goes away. Um, but I think you'll find that most newsmen and news people and news women are news people all their lives. And if they're part of the story, whether they're desking it or editing it or, or actually out in the field soaking wet and writing it, mm -hmm. they still get the same buzz out. So you reported live from Mumbai, right, during the 2008 terror attacks. And what are the basic guidelines of uh, reporting at such times? Like, what information should or should not be divulged? Or knowing that terrorists may or may not access to the local media. I know it's a little risky, right? I, I think when, you know, when we, when we cover events, we report everything. You know, we don't hold back on anything. Mm -hmm. So we don't take any kind of... Um, the only time we would kind of think about the ethics of writing a particular story is if it got other people into danger. Okay. For example, if the army is about to attack a town mm -hmm. and you're embedded with that patrol and I said, we are going to attack this town, if you wrote a story about that attack and published it globally, the people on the other end will be ready for that attack. More people may die in that conflict. So that, that's an ethical question. That's very difficult. 
that's, that's, that's very different to saying what you would write and what you wouldn't write. Uh, Reuters would write everything truthful and honest and just put it out there. We wouldn't hold back. If it upset the government, well, too bad. If it upsets the government, too bad. You know, as, long as, it's, as long as it's the truth, then we would publish it. So we wouldn't really think about it. There was some criticism on the Bombay bombings about um, you know, TV with, with telling the attackers on TV what the army was doing. There was a lot of criticism of the local TV after that because they were actually feeding information. Well, I would say that's probably the, you know, the fault of the police for actually giving that information out in the first place. So it's kind of chicken and egg. It's what, what comes first? You, know? uh, you have been reporting from hostile environments. And what toll does reporting in such places, uh, I mean, places take on one as a human being? Like, I ask you, I mean, what changes has it brought to your life as a human being, not as a human I think um, when you see bad stuff, um, yes, it does impact you as a human being. Um, you're, you're, you're looking at dead bodies, you're experiencing explosions, you're seeing violence around you, and that affects different journalists in different ways. Um, yes, it does. We, we have a program in our company where we have counselling and help uh, post the Philippines event. We're, we're watching staff very carefully to see if they uh, develop any signs or signals of stress, post-traumatic stress and things like that. We have a whole program to do with that, which most grown-up organisations do. Um, it, it does affect you. You have to be aware of becoming too blasé about it. Some journalists become almost in their mind, almost become soldiers. And that's a very bad thing, because they stop being objective. And, and, and there's an air of bravado around them. You know, and, oh, dead bodies don't worry me, and, you know, those kind of things. They're not only dangerous to be with, because they start to behave in a very rash way in, in dangerous situations, but their copy becomes less objective, because they're living the story. You see what I mean? So it, it can't help but harden you if you deal with bad things. But you have to learn to cope with it and kind of put it to the back of your mind. Different people will deal with it in different ways. And that also adds to being, I mean, for the experience of being good right? Yes. You know, and that's when you take someone who's done a lot of bad things, been in bad places, you generally put them into training. Because then they can pass on all that expertise and knowledge, and hopefully other people don't get hurt and affected by it. But people react to those things in a very different way. Some people can cope with it very well, mm -hmm. other people can really go to pieces. You see that in the military all the time. Yeah. You know, certain like a certain number of soldiers perfectly fine when they come out of a war zone, others just completely fall apart. So it depends on the individual. Okay, today it's been five years after the Mumbai terror attack happened. What memories haunt you from that day the most? Um, I think the ease at which it was done. You know, it was a bit 9-11, you know, with a few box cutters and that, they just turned the world upside down. And these guys, it was a very simple attack, it was very simply planned, you know, they, they put a lot of the ordnance in the hotels before, they, before the attack happened, they just checked it into rooms. So, it was a very simple and effective attack. Um, I think the one thing that struck me throughout this whole thing is that the rest of Bombay just carried on almost as normal. You know, the next day, not a hundred yards from the hotel, a guy was there cooking by the roadside with his food store, and you could hear the shooting. You know, life went on completely as normal. That was, I wrote a story about it afterwards. That struck me. Most cities would just oh, be horrified. But it's, Indians just went, ah, you know, and got on with it. It was fantastic. So that, that, that struck me. I think the, um, the way the police and the military dealt with it was very good. Um, a bit slow to start, but actually pretty effective at the end of it. But I think that was the one thing. It was, it was that attitude of the city in general saying, oh, well, this has happened, let's just get on with life. And they did. It's the same thing happened after the train bombings. It's a remarkable resilience. You know, a lot of Western societies would just collapse in a heap and be sobbing and, you know, for days on end. And it, it's just, you know, here, everyone recovers incredibly quickly and is very resilient. So that according to you is a good thing? I think it's a testament to the way people, um, how, I wouldn't say tough, but, you know, there's, there's a fatalism about things that, that, you know, in the West people are in the main very comfortable and the bad things happen with it, the, you know, to the, they can't cope with it. They don't actually realise how comfortable they are. You know, they complain about very small things, when big things happen, they just go to pieces. I, I, I think, no, I, I think 
is part of being human. That resilience is part of the human condition. Right? If we weren't, if we weren't resilient, we, none of us would be here. The early, the early guys would have just given up. Oh, this is too hard. You know? So no, there's nothing wrong with being tough like that. So you've been working for quite long as a journalist, and you must have dealt with a lot of different types of people, right? So what advice would you like to give to us young journalists? I think listen and understand. I think there's not enough listening and understanding of people. You see it in news stories all the time. Um, news stories that are written from a certain angle. Discuss good, discuss bad. You see that all the time. Okay? There's, some, there's a, a cartoon I saw many years ago, G8 and Jihad. Right? And, and there's this bifurcation of views. Bad guys, good guys. Right? Um, I, I think that um, is, is, is one of the main things. It, it, it's, it's not something that is good. Uh, you can't do the good cop, bad cop thing, or these are good guys, these are bad guys, and generalise that. There's far too much generalisation goes on in, in, in the media globally. Alright, Mr. Smith, it was a pleasure to have you here for Soft Copy. Thank, Thank you, you so much, much for coming.